people, as soon as I quote from the Bible, say, oh, I, we, can't, we can't use the Bible. It's been corrupted. It's been changed. It's been uh, polluted. It's been accreted. It's been deleted. All these different claims about this book. And when I ask them a little bit more and I find out what they're saying, what, what they're saying is that you have many different versions. Mm. You have the NIV, which is New International Version. You have the NEV, the New English Version. You have the... Uh, uh, the King James Version, KJV, you have the New American Standard Bible, you have uh, Good News for uh, Modern mm -hmm. Man, you have many different versions, they're saying, which means many different Bibles. What they're confusing are translations. These are not versions in, in the same sense of the word. Basically, they're different English translations. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, as we're speaking English, if you were to go back, uh, you're Lebanese, if you were to go back and to translate this into Arabic, there are probably three or four different ways to say what I've just said exactly. in Arabic. Yes. And th it, that's why translations need to keep up with the modern language. Ah, when you look at the Bible, the NASB, uh, New American Standard Version, probably sticks closest to the Hebrew and the Greek word for word the same, but it's very difficult to read because we don't have the same grammatical structure in English that you do in Arabic. Mm. The NIV is a much more modern translation of the same Hebrew and the Greek. Mm -hmm. NEV is more in uh, popular parlance. Uh, Good News for Modern Man is a version that was created for people that speak English as a second language, so only uses 500 words. And so therefore, it, I'm sorry, 2,000 words. So therefore, it uses a very small vocabulary to help people who are uh, it's not their native tongue. Now, you could say the same thing about the Quran. Hmm. There are many different versions of the Quran. You just stop and ask yourself, this one here I'm looking at is called the uh, Muhammad Taqi Uddin Al-Hilali. And it's also Musin Khan. This is the Hilali Khan version. Hmm. But there's also Piktal's version, there's also Yusuf Ali's version, there's Rodman's version, there's also Arbery's version. I've just given you five different translations of this book, the Quran, from the Arabic into the English. None of those five agree. Hmm. They're completely different in their translations. And what's more, even the verses don't agree. At least in every one of the translations of the Bible, the verses are all the same. Not so the Quran. And so many of the references that I'll be giving you, not only in this talk, but ones I have given you and ones I will give you, I will say uh, su such a Surah 19, Ayah 19. But if you look at uh, Rodman's translation or if you look at Pictal's translation, it probably won't be verse 19. You'll have to look above and be behind about five verses either side to find exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. These are nothing more than translations. They're not differences. They're not different Qurans. We would not make that claim against the Quran. Muslims should not make that claim against the Bible. Be make sure Muslims, and I say this to Muslims in, uh, in all faith, in good faith, please be careful when you're making these accusations against the Bible that you understand the facts behind it. The great thing about the Bible, it can be translated in any language. Mm. It is not just in Hebrew and Greek. It is just as be good, well understood in Arabic or in English. In fact, right now there are 2,500 translations of this book. Wow. And there's a new translation coming online every 10 days. Mm. Every 10 days, a new New Testament is coming into a language somewhere in the world. If I can, sorry, just stop you there. Why is it not a concern for God to have you know, many languages and that the essentially the message of the Bible or the Quran can be taken to that group of people in their language. Why is that not a problem with, uh, you know, the Christian book, the Bible, but it is a problem with the Quran? Muslims, in fact, usually it's the first, the mo Muslims usually give me that accusation. Uh -huh. They say, listen, you cannot read this book unless you read it in Arabic. And so okay. if you look at my Quran here, I have it both in English and in Arabic. Mm. And they say, this is the Quran. This is nothing more than the interpretation of the meaning of the Noble Quran. Mm. It's not even a, tr they would say that it is impossible to translate the Quran into any language. Really? Now, you know what that tells me? No, what? It tells me that the God behind this book can only be understood in one language. Mm. It says that Allah, what they're telling me is that Allah can only be understood in one language. What they're also saying is that Allah is incapable of communicating his word to anybody else but the Arabs. Mm, they, which they, suggests right off the top of my head that 85% of all Muslims cannot read God's holy word in their own language. Because mm. 85% of Muslims don't speak Arabic. Wow. Now, this book you can translate into every language. Mm. Remember? 2,500 and 93% of the world's population now can read the Bible in their own native tongue. Now, what's that say to you? Mm. I'll tell you what it says to yeah, me. Yeah. 
It says that the God behind this book can be understood in every language. Exactly, the yes. God behind this book comes down to our level, walks and talks with us, but also communicates us in any language. So which is the more universal revelation? Mm -hmm. It looks like this is the more the Bible, universal yes. revelation because the God behind it is capable of being understood by everyone, unlike mm -hmm. the God behind this book. I mean, essentially as well, just on that point, God would be forcing us to become academics if we lived in different countries, we would have to learn that language and, and practically that's, that's what God would become interested in, us learning that language so that we can understand or discern the meaning behind it. But that's not practical, is it? It's not practical and it's not the example of God himself. Because mm. when God came to earth, who did he come as? He came as a Jew. That's when God right. came to earth as a Jew, he started speaking uh, not only Hebrew, but he also spoke Aramaic. Mm. So God took on himself, and as it says in Philippians 2, verse 6 to 11, took on himself the image of a man, took on himself the form of a man, humbled himself. Ooh, I love that. Humbled mm. himself, which means he also became like us. He spoke our language, dressed like us, came as a little babe, lived amongst us for 33 years. And in speaking our language, he modeled for us how we're to do it. We're also to incarnate ourselves. As God incarnated himself in humanity, we're to incarnate ourselves in the different cultures we go to, and we're to incarnate this word. Mm. So it's an incarnate word. It's a word for everybody, not just for Hebrews, and not just for the Greeks. Mm. It's for everybody, including you and me. Oh, thank you. If we can go back now to the different translations and the manuscripts, if we can talk about that. Okay, let's go to the manuscript mm. evidence. Now, what Muslims will say is that the Quran has never changed. They will say that the Quran is exactly, this book here is the same, the Arabic part, not the English, the Arabic part is exactly the same that has always existed in heaven. In Surah 85, Ayah 22. Oh, so not just for 1,400 years. No, oh, this has always existed. Okay. Surah 85, Ayah 22 is the verse they point to. Mm. And that verse says, for the preserved tablet. Now, any exegete, any scholar, any com uh, uh, commentator on that verse, uh, whether they Tabari or Zamakshari, Suti, Al-Badawi, any of them, they all say that Surah 85, Ayah 22 refers to those tablets that have always existed. They're preserved, that means they have never been created. So it's the uncreated Quran that has always existed in heaven. Mm. Now that is problematic. You can see, I see why you're questioning that suddenly because that seems to commit shirk, does it not? It yeah. now so submits that there is something that coexists with God that's outside of him because how can a tablet be God? Mm. Ooh, doo -doo 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 -doo. We'll get to that in another talk because that's <laughs> problematic in and of itself. Nonetheless, what they would say is this book has always existed. So what Gabriel did, all he did from that period of 610 to 632, that 22 year period, he then s sent down portions of it at a time, the Meccan material, which is the latter part, uh, this part, the second part, uh, from 610 to 622, and the Medinan, which would be this first part mm. from 622 to 632, the last 10 years of his life. So that this compilation was and sent down over a period of uh, 22 years. Now, that's what Muslims say. The difficulty with that is they, they say that, that therefore everything that Muhammad was given was written down. When Muhammad died, this had not yet been written down. Wow. There was no text that had been written down. It had been memorized by many of his companions. Parts of it had been written on stones, on bones, uh, on bark. We do know that. That's well documented so in Al-Buhari. It was scattered almost was scattered. with different people, different places. It was written on certain objects. Yes. I don't, yeah. And then what you need to do is you need to go back to the traditions. They tell you what happened. And very clearly it says that uh, under Abu Bakr, the first caliph, he had Zaid ibn Thabit. Zaid ibn Thabit was the scribe or the secretary of Muhammad to compile the first recension, the first text of the Quran. That was done between 632 and 634, that two years right after Muhammad died. That copy was given to Hafsa, one of the wives of Muhammad, and she put it under her bed, so the tradition tells us, and stayed there. Mm. Now let's jump 18 years, let's, eight, between 18 and 20 years to the time of Uthman. We go back to Al-Buhari, and we go back to volume 6, Akbar number 509 and 510. When you go to Al-Buhari, volume 6, 509 and 510, it picks up the story from there. Uthman is the caliph at this time. Hudayfa comes to him and says, what are we going to do when much of the Quran is now being lost at the Battle of Yamama, soon after Abu Bakr, when Abu Bakr was uh, caliph? And many of those who had memorized the Quran had died at the Battle of uh, Yamama. Because of that, those who were dying off were taking the Quran with them. Mm. So he goes to Uthman and says, we must write it down so that we will not have different uh, different references like the Christians and Jews, different texts. Mm. So Uthman goes to Zaid ibn Thabit again. Remember, he's the one that wrote the first recension down. 
And he says in Akbar number 509, take Hafsa's copy, that copy that had been retained under the bed, take that and you along with Zubair, Alas, and Harith, four of you, rewrite the Quran. Now, you can see a problem right there. Why do you rewrite something that it was complete to begin with? Why did you mm. just take Hafsa's copy? Why do they have to rewrite it? That's right. And then it says, if you should disagree, how can you disagree? If you're just writing it word for word, if it's the same that's always been in heaven, why would there be any disagreement? Mm. If you disagree, write it in the Qureshi dialect. Immediately see there's problems here. Mm -hmm. As an Arabic speaker, you know that a dialectic difference in Arabic has to take vowelization. Because every Arabic word is, is a combination, is, is three letters that have recombinations on that. Mm -hmm. And so this, the, the root of every Arabic word is three letters and it's consonantal. There is no vowelization. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you read your newspaper, there's no vowelization there. Why is it when you read a newspaper today that is printed in Egypt, in your Lebanese, you don't have vowelization? Mm, because your dialect would be different. Yeah. And you include and you impose on it your own vowelization. So whether they are in Morocco or whether they are in Jordan okay. or whether they are in, in Egypt, they will put different vowelizations depending on their dialect. Mm -hmm. Vowelization is needed for dialectic differences. Well, mm -hmm. when were vowelizations introduced into Arabic? I don't know. Not until the late 8th century. Wow. So how could you have, in the mid-7th century, a man named Uthman talking about different dialectic differences on a consonantal text? Ooh, oh, do, 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 do. Good enough. You've got a problem here. Yeah, yeah. Proving that this shows that this had to be written in the 9th century, and that's exactly when Bukhari wrote this down. Bukhari was actually imposing this onto that argument onto it. That was an argument that would exist in the 9th century, but not the 7th century. Now let's move back. What does he say next? Hmm. And then he then... Told basically, he told Zaid ibn Thabit to rewrite the text if they had any discussion to make sure that it was in the Qureshi dialect. And then he said, It says in 50510, oh, the next um, I, uh, Akbar, it says, He then took all the manuscripts that were remaining and burnt them. Ooh, can you see the problem? Mm. That exposes everything right there. That's right. Why do you burn manuscripts? If there were differences, absolutely to hide the them. Only, yeah. That's right. The only reason you would burn a manuscript is because you want to get rid of the evidence. Mm. That means that there was a lot of different manuscripts that existed. It looks like it's quite a few different ones that disagreed with each other. Now we do know that in the traditions, Dr. Arthur Jeffrey, who is a well-known scholar, has gone back and has looked at all the traditions on the references to the many different manuscripts. And there's tradition after tradition after tradition that speaks about these differences. You can look and see Al Bukhari. Just look at Sahih Muslim and Ibn Dawud. Just look at those three compilers of the hadith and look and see what they say. Mm -hmm. And they say example after example after example of where these different codices. We know of four different codices, that means four different books, codexes, that, that were, became very popular in four different cities. They're called the Metropolitan Codices. Mm -hmm. There's the Codex of Uba ibn Ka'b. The Codex of Uba ibn Ka'b became very popular in Damascus. We know of the Codex of Ibn Masud. The Codex of Ibn Masud became very popular in Baghdad. We know of the Codex of Ibn Musa. That uh, codex became very popular in Basra, and then the codex of what, that I mentioned earlier, uh, Zaid ibn Tabi. So you have four different authors, four different codices, none of the four agree. Mm. And when Dr. Arthur Jeffrey in 1930s, 1935, when he looked at the disagreements, he found 15,000 disagreements just with those four codices. Wow. So how could the Muslims claim that this book has never changed, they're not looking at their traditions. Mm. Their traditions are very clear that there was parts that were lost, some of it had been changed, others had been, had been added to, and there's reference after reference after reference of the differences just between those four codices. We, do, we know that uh, Uba ibn Qab's codex and also Ibn Masud's codex had two extra surahs. So they had 116 surahs. Mm. How can you have 116 when there's only 114 Four, in the Quran yeah. that we have today? So these are, 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 these are claims that Muslims make today that they cannot support. You mm. cannot tell me that the Quran that we have in our hand today is the same that was there in the 7th century. And here's the other thing. Here's the big problem. Where are those original codices? Because according to Al-Buhari, volume 6, number 510, it says that once he had destroyed and burnt those manuscripts, he then sent one copy to Basra, one copy to Baghdad, one copy to Damascus, and retained one in Medina. So four copies were made of that Uthmanic recension. Mm -hmm. Where are they? I don't know. Ask your Muslim friend next time. Where mm. are those four copies? See, we're talking about the seventh century. We're just talking about 1400 years ago. There should be all kinds of examples. You come to London, I'll take you down to the British Library, and I'll show you the entire New Testament from the fourth century, That's 300 right. years before this. Before. So they have no original copies. 
Not at all. Wow. Now, so, Muslims try to claim they do. Okay. They will come up with two, and we're going to show them on the screen there. If you look over there, you'll see a copy of one called the top, top copy. Mm -hmm. Look at the top copy, and you will see it has a script that's completely different than what we see here. If you notice, this is a much different script. But the one you see in the top copy there, that's there in Istanbul, in, uh, in Turkey, considered to be one of these four Uthmanic recensions. You will notice it has an elongation. It is, it, it is written in a Kufic script, uh, a Basid script, which was introduced at a much later period. Mm -hmm. It has, if you look carefully, you can see medallions on it. And the medallions show versification. Yes. Have, where medallion, that's where the verse begins. Versification was introduced in the late 8th century. So how can you have all this in a 7th century manuscript? Ooh, doo -doo 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 -doo. It has justification on either side. That was borrowed from the Christian manuscripts. That was introduced in the early 9th century. So most scholars today would say that a top copy is a 9th century manuscript, not a 7th century manuscript. Mm. Now look up there again. You'll see another one. Here is the Samarkand. The Samarkand is the second one they like to point to. And the Samarkand manuscript, again, you can see there is that elongated script that you find in the top copy. But look, we're going to show you four different pages on that. Four, and look at the four different pages. It's four different styles of writing showing that it was an amalgamation of different scribes. Hmm. Again, it has that, uh, it, it's missing the diacritical marks, but it doesn't have vowelization, proving therefore that it is an early script, but it's not a 7th manus uh, century manuscript. It again is a 9th century manuscript for the same reason that the top copy is. Hmm. So the two that Muslims like to claim today are really, really over 100 to 200 years later. Hmm. So they've got to find a manuscript that's from the 7th century. Hmm. And they aren't able to do this. They're not able to do this. Why? Wow. Ask many Muslim, where are those four manuscripts? Give me one, just one manuscript. So now, in 1975, when they're in Sana'a in Yemen, they were cleaning out the dome of the Sana Mosque. They found a trap door. They opened the trap door and thousands of manuscripts fell to the ground. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not surprising because when Qurans do get deter deteriorate, they don't burn them, they don't bury them. They usually just put them up in mosques, exactly. uh, the dome mosque, and they leave them there and they forget them. And these were all forgotten. And as they were uh, going through in these different manuscripts, they came across one manuscript they couldn't read. The reason why is it had a text, a script that was very archaic. It didn't have any diacritical marks, no dotting above the lower, below the line uh, for, for, for showing the, uh, the, which, consonant, which consonants they were referring to. And there was no vowelization on them. Plus, there was no medallions to show versification as well. So it had no diacritical marks, no vowelization, and no diacritical marks. And they couldn't read it. They had a hard time. So they brought two scholars down from Germany. They flew them down in 1981 to look at this manuscript. These are known as Dr. Gerd Puin and Dr. von Bothmer, considered to be probably the, today the world's scholars' authority on archaic Arabic script. They came in 1981 to look at this manuscript, and as soon as they looked at this manuscript, they took pictures of it, put it onto microfilm. The Yemeni government confiscated their microfilms, would not let them see their own microfilms, because they started hearing what they were finding and what they were ah, seeing. So they got worried. They did get worried. Mm -hmm. Now, they did, not, uh, get, they did not return those manuscripts to Dr. 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 Prin or Dr. von Bothmer, who both taught at Saarland University in Saarbrück in Western Germany until 1997. Mm -hmm. I went to visit Dr. Gerd Prin in 1999 in Germany, and he showed me those that manuscript. I can't show you them right now, but I want you to look on the screen. I want to just show you two pages that I have up there. Uh, you notice, he's, here's a page where you see a yellow mark halfway down. Mm -hmm. Above that is Surah 19. Okay. Where that yellow mark is, it jumps to Surah 22. Mm -hmm. The question you should ask is, what happened to Surah 20 and 21? Mm, that's right. What, so what obviously when that manuscript is written, and that page, that page you're looking at has been dated to 705 AD. Muhammad died in 632. The Quran is supposed to compile in 650. So we're talking basically about 50 to 55 years after Muhammad, uh, the, the recension, Uthmanic recension. Here you see, uh, interesting, look at the script. That script that is on the right-hand side is what we know as Hijazi script. That's the kind of script that would have been in existence when Muhammad was living. Hmm. The Hijazi script is a 7th century script, and it's also an 8th century script. But it went out of style in the mid-8th centuries. When you look at that, you will see on the right side is a early 8th century, 705 script, missing two surahs. Wow. Look on the left side. See on the left page? Mm. There, surah 20 begins. Yeah, there. Mm. It's in the wrong place, it's next to it, but it's in a completely different script. Can you see? <laughs> you can see it originally. You can see it's two different scripts. That's this right. is a much later, this is an Abbasid script, which was introduced about 50 to 60 years later. So what does that tell you? Mm. Well, I know what it tells me. It tells me that we're looking at an evolution of the Quran that still was not complete in 705. Wow. Ooh, tu, 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 tu. 
Now that has a huge implication because if Muslims say the Quran has never been changed, the Quran has the Quran that we have in our hand today is the same Quran that has existed in heaven since the beginning, well, not beginning, ever everlasting. Yet here you have a script that shows that even as late as 705, it still was not completed. It still was missing surahs. They're in the wrong places. Then you've got a real damaging, uh, basically, a manuscript. Now that, is, that page that you're looking at there, and others like it, have been dated to 705. That's proving to be probably the oldest manuscript we have available today. The Yemeni government will not let people look at that manuscript. Hmm. The Germans are the only ones that have been able to film it, and they only have facsimiles of it because of filming. Isn't it interesting, if this is the oldest Quran in existence, the Yemeni government could be making a mint off this. Hmm. Why aren't they sending it around for people to look at? Very interesting, yeah. I mean, they've got to be hiding something. Well, there's something more that's yeah. even more damaging that I'm not permitted to say on television. Okay. Because what Garrett Quinn and them are finding, they're going to have to publish it. Once they publish it, then we can go and actually tell you what it is. Mm. But it's going to destroy the Quran when it comes out. Mm. This is why I thank God we don't have these problems. Because mm. what we're going to do in the next segment, and what I want to do is I want to look at the Bible and ask the same question of the Bible. Do we have manuscript problems? Mm -hmm. But what we already know is already, we have seen, let's just review very quickly. We have already seen that the Quran cannot be traced back 1400 years. There is no manuscript evidence that goes that back that far. What's more, they are now finding what they call palimpsests. Palimpsests are, are fragments of the Quran that when you put under ultraviolet light, you see one script that's underneath another script. Mm. It was a writing that had been washed off and rewritten over top. And with ultraviolet night now in the 21st century, we can now look and see the other writing, and they're separating the two writings. Both of them are proving to be Quranic, but they're completely different references. In fact, there's two different scripts showing that there's an evolution. This is the first time we've been able to look using modern technology to show that the Quran was evolving in the late 7th century. These palimpsests are from 650, 660, 670, moving up into the, the Sufyani period, up into Abdul al-Malik. Mm. We need to come to Abdul al-Malik, because Abdul al-Malik, who ruled from 685 to 705, is the man that changes everything. Mm. Basically, it's Abdul al-Malik that many of your scholars are now pointing to, because he is the second of the Marwanat Caliphs under the Umayyad Caliphate, and he is the one that built the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock is a beautiful building. You can see a picture of it up there. You can mm -hmm. see that beautiful dome. Now, the Dome of the Rock was built for a very interesting reason. It was built to commemorate Muhammad going up to the up to seven heavens. On, he went on the back of the winged horse uh, from Medina up to Jerusalem. From Jerusalem at that rock, he supposedly was to have gone up to heaven and talked to Allah and then talked to Moses and goes back and forth and gets five prayers. Now, that's another story. What's interesting is when you go to the Dome of the Rock and you look at the inner ambulatories, the inner, inner parts, the only original part of that building, mm. they have Quranic references up there, but they do not correspond with the Quran we have here. Really? In fact, it's fascinating because they don't say anything about that event of Muhammad going up to the seven heavens. Mm. They are all anti-Christian polemics. Wow. Now, I'm going to leave that there because what that is showing us is there even as late as 691 when that building was built or 690 when that building was built, mm. you still did not have a Quran that we had, a reference that we have in our hand today. Mm -hmm. That's a hugely damaging for Islam. Oh, it is, definitely. Thank God we don't have that problem. Yes. <laughs> the next question we're going to get into is, what about the Bible? Exactly. We'll leave it there. We'll come back to that. Exactly. If I can just refer to one thing as well, would you encourage Christians to study these things? I mean, you, you've said a lot of information now in a short period of time. Should they study this type of stuff and engage with Muslims about these things? Absolutely, because everything comes down to these two books. Mm. This is my revelation, this is their revelation. Everything I'm going to say is going to have to come out of this book. Everything they say is going to come after this book, and they contradict each other. So we've got to say, which is the real revelation? Which is the historically provable uh, book? Well, mm -hmm. you're going to see in the next talk how this book is so much more superior to this book. We've already shown you a few damages. We're going to show you some even more damaging material the next time we talk. Mm. Thank God we can come back to real revelation, the real scripture, and this is it. Thank you, Jay. Once again, it's always a pleasure to have you come and speak to us and share some of your insights about these things. Mm -hmm. If I can just simply say to the audi audience, uh, I hope that you're not offended by the things that we're saying. Take these things as a challenge. Go away, check them out. Use that passion, use that energy to find out whether these things are true.